Tonight, we're in Edmonton, a city with just one message. We want the cup. Go, Warriors, go! Bring that cup home! The excitement, the nerves, the sky-high stakes. It's comes down to one game. We break down the preparations and the pressure as Edmonton looks to complete one of the greatest comebacks in hockey history. And testing Trudeau, the eve of a critical Toronto by-election. Mr. Trudeau will be quaking in his boots very soon. The Conservatives look to make gains in a Liberal stronghold. Repeat after me. Stop! Open that tent, Simon Bird! The foul-mouthed message sparking outrage with some BC First Nations. It, it is completely toned up. The demands for an apology from some Hollywood heavyweights. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. We are here in the Ice District in less than 24 hours. This area will be packed with Oiler fans willing their team toward the Stanley Cup. The rush here in Edmonton after Game 6 hasn't subsided. This city still buzzing with anticipation. The team, however, is now in Florida, gearing up physically and mentally for Game 7 against the Panthers after fighting back from what appeared to be near certain defeat to the edge of an era-defining comeback. Hopes are high that Edmonton can end Canada's 31-year Stanley Cup drought. As Terry Reese shows us, in Edmonton, the dream of victory is very real. And the ride for fans, it has been exhilarating. For fans in Edmonton, the Stanley Cup is tantalizingly close. But for now, the only one they can touch is this giant replica. They wanted to see the Stanley Cup, <laughs> so we said, well, come here. <laughs> Friday night's stunning victory over the Florida Panthers sets up a game seven that has Edmonton buzzing. Go, Warriors, go! Bring that cup home! Even on a blazing hot summer Sunday, hockey is on everyone's mind. We're hoping we just kick some blank, 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 is how you would put it. But yes, we're all looking forward to it. For Skinner. Stuart Skinner emerging as a local hero in this series, recording 21 saves and an assist in game six. The youngest of nine kids, he's brought intense pride to his Edmonton family. The excitement in this house and, and the cheering and, and uh, the support has just been tremendous. The teams practiced in Florida today. Connor McDavid saying he's prepared for this final challenge. We feel good about where things are at, but with that being said, it comes down to one game. And while the game may be in Florida, Edmonton's Rogers Place is sold out. 18,000 fans expected at Canada's biggest watch party, with thousands more gathering in the ice district, drinking up the ambience. The last time Edmonton got this close to the Stanley Cup was 18 years ago. For a generation of fans, this has been an amazing run. Let's go! Let's go! It's been so cool to see uh, the city come alive and the people downtown um, being on Jasper Ave on Friday night. The energy, I've never seen anything like it. So it's uh, been just fantastic seeing everyone come out and spend time in the city and celebrate together. So, yeah, it's been awesome. Terry, some of Edmonton's Stanley Cup runs have ended with disorder on the streets, so Edmonton police will be looking for any signs of trouble. That's right, Ian. We saw what happened here in 2006, also back in some of the 1980s playoff runs and 2011 in Vancouver. So that's always a possibility. We talked with a public safety expert today. He says there is a chance for mayhem when you have crowds this large, but we've seen the thousands coming out every night to these runs. They've been quite peaceful, and police are just hoping that it stays that way. Yeah, it was remarkably peaceful on, on Friday night. Terry, thank you very much. You're welcome, Ian. And in Florida, the Panthers, of course, preparing, strategizing for a way to try to break the Oilers' momentum. Both teams taking to the ice today, focused, getting the strategy and unity they'll need to win it all. Well, Radio Canada sports reporter Patrick Henry is in Fort Lauderdale. Lucky guy. Uh, Patrick, you were at the morning skate. Uh, give me a sense of the mood among the players. 
The mood is uh, pretty much like usual. Both uh, team attend the practice, even if it was optional. Most of the players were there because they want to keep doing the business as usual. But at the same time, every player we talked to said it's a bit special to be there. Uh, they all dreamt about uh, playing in a Game 7 in the Stanley Cup. Uh, we know for Canadian for sure, but Leon Dreisaitl from Germany said it. Uh, Alexander Barkov from Finland said that he dreamt in his basement or playing in the street when he was young to score the winning goal in overtime in the Game 7. So even if we try to keep the thing as usual, it's going to be pretty special for them tomorrow. And the Oilers are really confident because they won the last three games. But the Panthers uh, show some confidence as well because they know they can beat the Oilers. They did it three times as well uh, early in the series. Patrick, you know what it's like in Edmonton. Everywhere you look, there's signs of the Stanley Cup Finals. I assume in Fort Lauderdale, not exactly the same thing. No, it's totally different. There's a big party before the game. Like, we've been there for the first few games, and there's a big party where the fans are, but there's not as many fans as there is in Edmonton, so it's totally different. But we're going to hear a lot of Edmonton fans tomorrow because there's a charter who landed a few minutes ago with 90 fan, uh, 95 fans in it, and there's a lot of people who make the travel. We've seen a lot yesterday during our travel uh, across the country to come here to Florida. So that will be a great atmosphere. Uh, the, the sad thing about the pandemic is there's a lot of tickets for sale. There's a lot of fan who's trying to sell their ticket for more money, even if they're a season older. Maybe they don't consider that game really important. We don't know, or they want to make money, but there will be uh, quite a crowd tomorrow. That's going to be interesting. Patrick Henry in Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. You're welcome. And coming up, a look at how players will face the intense mental pressure of Game 7 with someone who's been there, former Oiler and six-time Stanley Cup winner Kevin Lowe. That's in about 20 minutes. Turning to the other high-stakes test tomorrow night, a critical federal by-election seen by many as a referendum on Justin Trudeau's leadership. The Toronto St. Paul's riding has been red for more than 30 years, but as J.P. Tasker tells us, that liberal loyalty is now in question. The Liberal Party is sending in some heavy hitters to shore up the vote in Toronto St. Paul's. I have been out campaigning, knocking on doors a lot in St. Paul's. In a sign of how important Monday's federal by-election is, Christia Freeland is just one of a dozen cabinet ministers who've campaigned for their candidate, Leslie Church. Leslie is working her heart out and the whole team is there with her. And we're just going to keep on working until the last minute. My hope is that she's going to be able to succeed, but you can't take any of this for granted. Perched above downtown Toronto, the Liberals have held this wealthy riding for more than 30 years. But polls show the party is on shaky ground, some voters blaming the leader. And I think Mr. Trudeau will be quaking in his boots very soon because it's just time. Church has heard that Trudeau fatigue on the campaign trail. People have been through a lot, a pandemic, inflation, interest rates, so I expect that. A Liberal loss in a safe seat like this could upend Canadian politics, but Church remains optimistic. When they look at the alternatives, voters are wise. The main alternative is Conservative candidate Don Stewart. Look, we've had a super busy morning, knocking on doors. Yeah talking to voters at doors. The Conservatives have a 15-point lead in Ontario. That means Stewart could pull off a huge upset. All of those metrics point to a deep and broad desire for change that extends into a city like Toronto. This pollster is expecting a narrow Liberal win, but he says the Conservatives have some momentum. Liberals aren't all that enthusiastic right now about Mr. Trudeau, about the government, and Conservatives are deeply motivated to get out and vote. Justin Trudeau has said he's not going anywhere, but a poor showing in Monday's by-election could lead to calls for new leadership, this time from his own party. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. And join Power & Politics host David Cochran tomorrow night as he and a team of panelists break down those by-election results. The coverage starts at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and you can tune in on the CBC News app, cbc.ca, CBC Explore, or the CBC News YouTube page. In Labrador, wildfires continue to threaten the town of Churchill Falls. Progress is being made, but the situation is volatile. According to the Premier, who visited the region today, hundreds were evacuated on Wednesday. Many have been staying in Happy Valley Goose Bay since then. That's where Kayla Hounsel is tonight to show us the outpouring of kindness for evacuees. Four 
days after they were forced to flee their homes, the people of Churchill Falls went to church. We pray especially for the Churchill Falls evacuees. Invited here to unite with the people who've taken them in. It means the world to us that people actually care. They've opened up their arms. Paula Brinson's husband works at the massive hydroelectric plant in Churchill Falls that provides power to parts of Newfoundland and Labrador and Quebec. Look at this. High tech. Today, he's showing the Premier and the CEO of Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro how they're remotely monitoring the plant from here in Happy Valley Goose Bay. A skeleton crew has stayed behind to run it for now. I think we can outlast the fire. We do have people that we can switch out. The Quebec water bombers that had come to help had to leave to fight their own fires. Two more are on the way from Saskatchewan. The fire is still burning out of control within seven kilometers of the town. Not good news for evacuees. Look, I wish I could give you an answer when you're going to return to Churchill Falls, but whatever we try to predict today, the only thing certain about that prediction would be it would probably be wrong. We cannot say thank you enough. Julie Brace is an Anglican priest in Churchill Falls and the Archdeacon of Labrador. It's easy to say, I believe in God. It's easy to say a prayer that's written in a book. But living that out is a different thing. And especially here um, in Labrador, the fact that we are connected to each other is so important because we're so isolated most of the time. We're so far apart from each other. Labrador is vast around here, known as the big land, and now the people with big hearts. <laughs> Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. And in northern Quebec, some reassuring news for about a thousand Port Cartier residents forced to evacuate on Friday. Uh, winds have shifted. Winds are now coming from the south, so the fires are growing away from the community. Officials say conditions have improved, but it's too soon to go home because of the intensity of the fires. Crews have only been able to tackle the flames from the air. Among the evacuees, inmates from a maximum security prison, which houses some notorious criminals. Russian officials say at least 15 police officers are dead after groups of gunmen in two cities attacked a synagogue and Orthodox churches in the North Caucasus region. Terrified residents captured gun battles from their windows, this one in the regional capital of Mahashkala. About 130 kilometers south, gunmen reportedly killed police officers and an Orthodox priest, a church and the city synagogue seen here set on fire. The fate of the attackers is still not clear, with reports that some were killed by police, others still at large. And in Kharkiv, Ukraine, officials say powerful Russian bombs struck a school and a private home, killing at least one person and wounding 10. In Russian-held Crimea, residents laid flowers for the four people killed when a Ukrainian missile was shot down but rained deadly debris on civilians at a nearby beach. Missiles, bombs, and drones are near constant threat. Prior Stewart is in Ukraine and shows us the fight against them is now falling on the shoulders of volunteers. Outside of Ukraine's capital, this group of volunteers gets ready for target practice. As the sun sets, the spotlight and laser come out, as well as this night's targets, balloons and paper lanterns. We're wearing the protective gear because these volunteers are shooting live rounds. They're doing it because it's practice, so they're able to shoot drones out of the sky. These volunteers often rush out in the middle of the night when they get a message saying a Russian drone has been sent to attack Kyiv and it will be flying through their area. The last one they shot down was in February with the help of Sasha Olenik, a police officer. The air defense system is meant for larger missiles, he said. We can hit targets that aren't very fast, like Shahed drones. Russia has launched the self-destructing drones throughout the war destroying infrastructure and killing civilians. This is the remnants of one of the three drones the volunteer group brought down. It's played a uh, rocket uh, Russian, made in East uh, Russia rocket. There are also bullet holes in this missile, which they fired at, but it ended up being intercepted by air defense. 
not far from the group's headquarters in a neighboring village. More drone training. This time teaching students how to use them to hit targets. They aren't using real grenades, but on the front line, they will. Both Ukraine and Russia are using these drones to attack military positions. You have to get the skills to um, control it in every kind of hard situations. Andrei Ovcherenko recently returned to Ukraine and plans to enlist and join a drone unit. It's like it, it became one of the most important things on the battlefield. It's like the eyes of the army right now. But they are also terrorizing Ukrainian cities, which is why this group will keep doing its weekly training and watching the sky. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Central Ukraine. Saudi Arabia says more than 1,300 people have died during this year's Hajj. Oh. Authorities pointed the finger at extreme heat and said the vast majority who died were unofficial pilgrims. Official pilgrims typically have access to air-conditioned buses and places to stay at night. Hundreds gathered in the small town of Harrow, Ontario tonight to remember a family of four found dead in their home on Thursday. A vigil was held in a soccer field where the two children often played and the mother walked every day for exercise. Police haven't released the names of the victims or details about what happened. Their deaths are still under investigation. Two famous Canadians are under fire for wading into a contentious debate in British Columbia. Ryan Reynolds and William Shatner are connected to an online ad against ocean salmon farming. It pits environmentalists against industry and divides First Nations. Yvette Bren now with a reaction to the provocative ad. You know, for almost a century, I have been a kind, decent Canadian. I just can't be Canadian about it any longer. The it William Shatner is talking about is ocean salmon farming. And his language in this ad from a digital marketing firm owned by Ryan Reynolds is definitely not polite. F off! Open that pen, salmon farms! The conservation group behind it makes no apologies for a stream of bleeped F-bombs. I think that the tone of the campaign really kind of reflects the way the majority of Canadians have been feeling for a long time about this issue. Um, and so we just wanted to cut to the chase and tell it how it is. The practice of net pen farming is set to be phased out by 2029, applauded by many in the seafood industry, like this former worker who was visiting a hatchery. Farm salmon do bring in new threats to the wild species, and it could just destroy the whole ecosphere of our natural wild fish. But critics of the ad say salmon farming brings hundreds of jobs to remote First Nations. I think it's incredibly disturbing, to be quite frank. It is completely tone deaf. In a statement issued June 21st, the Coalition of First Nations for Finfish Stewardship said they were offended by what they call a classic example of rich elite removed urban white men overriding the wishes of vulnerable Indigenous communities. Not all First Nations agree. Now, maybe the language that was used is not used by everybody, but I'll tell you, it's used by most everybody. These First Nations elders watched the conservation ad at a Sunday soccer game in Nanaimo. Your salmon farms are <laughs> of our wild salmon population. It's a <laughs> state on our nation. They say they had no problem with the language, nor the celebrity message. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. After battling back from a big series deficit, the Edmonton Oilers are now on the verge of a historic Stanley Cup win. Empty dead scores! The key ingredients that fuel their improbable comeback, next. Plus, a very young Oilers fan cheers his team from the crib. The moment he sang himself to sleep. And later, a political movement in the UK takes its cues from Canada. They stuck to their track. They didn't waver. Uh, they didn't listen to the criticism. What it could mean for the upcoming election. We're back in two. Edmonton's Ice District. Tomorrow, this space will be packed with thousands of fans, and Rogers Place will be filled to capacity, all to watch a Game 7 taking place 4,000 kilometers away in Florida. 
There have been some incredible performances on the ice to get the Oilers to this point. Paige Parsons shows us a team that has become more than the sum of its stars. Stick with what's been working. Oilers captain Connor McDavid says he's not changing anything ahead of Game 7 in the Stanley Cup Final. you got to prepare just like uh, you always do. You know, Obviously, it's not your ordinary game. Everybody understands that. But you got to make it as ordinary um, as possible in your in your head. McDavid is anything but ordinary. Critical to the Oilers' improbable comeback in the series against the Florida Panthers, many say he's the best hockey player seen in a generation. He's this close to a childhood dream, to something that he's worked for, for so hard, for so long, one win away. I think it's going to take a lot to deny Connor McDavid a Stanley Cup. Connor McDavid has done it again. McDavid is already breaking new ground. With 34 assists during the playoffs, he shattered a previous Wayne Gretzky record. He's not alone. With 16 postseason goals, Zach Hyman set a record in the NHL's post-salary cap era. And now, hitting 146 career power play goals, Leon Dreisaitl holds an all-time franchise record. Former Oilers goalie Joaquin Gage has been especially impressed by Edmonton born and raised goaltender Stuart Skinner. He just seems really dialed in and, I mean, the dancing in between. I'd be a nervous wreck in there at this point, right? I'll be able to answer that question. The way he talks in his interviews about embracing the moment, um, I mean, it's it, all those uh, cliches that you hear, stay in the moment, take it one game at a time. But he, to me, he's really, really doing it. If the Oilers win Monday, after starting the best of seven series with three losses, it'll be a feat not seen since the Second World War, when the Maple Leafs came back to win the 1942 Stanley Cup. 82 years later, the Oilers are looking to make history of their own. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. Here in Edmonton, where it's windy, by the way, fans are on edge on the eve of the big game. What will it take to bring the cup back to Canada? Plus, as the UK gets ready to vote, some are looking for an alternative to the two big mainstream parties. We need change in this country. There's too much going on, and they're not looking after us. Nigel Farage and the political inspiration he got from Canada. Plus, an Indigenous-run hospital and the community that's fought for its survival. You'd hear the stories about how people used to do their jobs and then go to the hospital to volunteer. Honoring its past and the new facility giving it a bright future. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Firefighters in Greece shared this photo of a destructive fire on the island of Hydra. It may have been sent by fireworks launched from a super yacht. Today, 13 crew members were taken in for questioning. Greece is dealing with a heat wave and a number of wildfires. As Britain heads to a July 4th election, the incumbent Conservatives are fighting on two fronts, Labour on the left, but also a new challenge from the right. The Reform Party, with a Made in Canada playbook, is led by Nigel Farage. Chris Brown caught up with him on the campaign trail. In the faded resort town of Clacton-on-Sea, one of the least diverse and poorest electoral districts in Britain, a familiar face on a mission to win a seat in Parliament has injected some unpredictability into the UK election. We need change in this country. There's too much going on and they're not looking after us. Nigel Farage says he expects the Labour Party will win this general election. He says his ambition is to become what he calls the real opposition and eventually replace the Conservative Party. Best known as Britain's biggest Brexiteer, he's back with a new party and a new goal. Good evening, Clacton! The party is Reform UK, and he says the inspiration comes from Canada, from Preston Manning and his populist Reform Party, which in 1993 swept the West and helped bury the progressive Conservatives. I met Preston a few years ago. I watched what they did. They stuck to their track. They didn't waver. Uh, they didn't listen to the criticism. And in the end, they sort of reverse took over the old Conservative Party. They are the model. Of course, the comparison has flaws. Even the most pessimistic polls suggest Rishi Sunak's Conservatives will still elect dozens of MPs. But on Clacton's waterfront, we found Farage's low-tax anti-immigrant message resonated. 
it needs addressing, something needs to be done because you can't have the rest of the world arriving here. Farage has also tapped into a more youthful crowd by amassing almost three quarters of a million followers on social media. You've sent me a few of his videos and I agree with a lot of the things that he says. After 14 years of conservative rule, the Labour Party under Keir Starmer says it's time for a change. Nigel Farage is hoping those on Britain's political right decide they need a change too. Chris Brown, CBC News in Clacton-on-Sea. Now it's time to break down the news shaping our world. Canada's first Indigenous-run hospital celebrates a century of healing and charting its own course. But first... Empty dead scores! The Oilers' gutsy comeback from a three-game deficit electrifies much of the country and pushes the Panthers to the wall. But with Canada's Stanley Cup hopes on their shoulders, how will the team handle the immense pressure to win? Once favored to win it all, Florida now faces a determined Edmonton team with momentum on its side after winning three straight games. Here's a quick look back at how we got here ahead of Monday's final showdown. With their eyes on the cup, the Oilers go into game one in Florida expecting a tough fight and they sure got one as the Panthers shut them out 3-0. Three like game two, Edmonton draws first blood, but Florida ties it up and pulls away the final score, 4-1 Panthers. Game three in Edmonton, the Panthers score first before taking a 4-1 lead. Edmonton does narrow the gap, but seems to run out of time. Final score, 4-3 Panthers. Now three games down, the Oilers come into game four like a team on fire, mauling the Panthers with goal after goal. Florida does manage to score one, but it's a blowout, 8-1 Oilers. Edmonton's still alive. Game five, back in Florida. Reinvigorated, the Oilers take a 3-0 lead before stretching the advantage to 4-1. The Panthers fight back, but Edmonton hangs on to win 5-3. Game six, back here in Edmonton, the Oilers come out swinging, scoring three times before Florida can respond. Two empty netters for insurance, Edmonton wins 5-1 before an ecstatic hometown crowd, tying the series in a remarkable comeback for a team that refuses to give up. Well, here's somebody who knows a lot about the pressure of Game 7s and winning Stanley Cups. Kevin Lowe has been on six Stanley Cup winning teams, two Game 7s, one with the Edmonton Oilers and one with the New York Rangers. And Kevin, first of all, from your own experience, what was it like the night before Game 7? If you're talking about the very first, uh, there will certainly be more nerves than I would have had in, in the latter stages. Um, uh, I'm thinking about probably, you know, the most the biggest one was the Flyers in 87. And, uh, you know, we let the Flyers back into the series. Uh, we lost game five, lost game six. And although, you know, we were tense a bit, uh, we knew that if we threw our best game at them that we'd probably win. So the night before uh, would have been, you know, uh, a little tense, but certainly... Uh, uh, lots of confidence knowing that uh, we can win a Stanley Cup. So 1987, Philadelphia Flyers were a really, really good team. I've heard some of your teammates talk about how tough a series that was. You're with the Edmonton Oilers. You've got Wayne Gretzky as your captain. Mark Messier is one of the assistant captains. Take us into the dressing room before that Game 7. Was it quiet? Were the leaders kind of cheering you guys on? What, what was happening inside that dressing room? Well, by the time you get to Game 7 in the Santa, Santa Cup Finals, everybody's pretty tired, you know, and, and that's what both uh, the Panthers and the Oilers will be feeling tomorrow. I mean, your, your, your adrenaline gets you up for the game. But, uh, you know, relative to your question and us back in 87, I think we would have been probably more quiet than we had been, been in the past. And that, would have, that really would have been a, a, a quiet confidence, you know, because we, we felt we were the better team and... But we hadn't played our best. And, uh, you know, it would have been just reaffirming to one another that, hey, listen, you know, eliminate the mistakes, uh, you know, abide by our code of playoff rules, and, uh, and we're going to win a cup. But, uh, you know, we got to be committed to that in order for that to happen. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned mistakes because so far 
this year. There have been a few mistakes. I guess this happens in, in sports, even at the highest levels. A bad clear by the goaltender, a, an errant pass by a defenseman. So, again, I want to see this through your eyes. When, when you were, you know, turned out to be a Hall of Fame defenseman, but in the first few minutes of those two Stanley Cup Game 7s, were you worried that you might be the guy who would make a mistake? <laughs> you're always worried. And that's why your, you know, your sense, uh, your keenness and your, you know, your overall preparedness, it is at its absolute best. Uh, I mean, that sounds a little fatal that you're actually sitting there worried to make a mistake. You can't be worried to make a mistake, but you also know that a mistake can be the game. Um, you know, when you come to the playoffs, you get the best teams. And typically, it's a, m a mistake uh, rather than an unbelievable play that results in goals in Game 7 in the finals. So, uh, you know, obviously, you, you've got to eliminate the mistakes. And, and, uh, and, you know, being a veteran player as I was at that particular time, and most of us were, uh, you know, we were pretty good at eliminating mistakes when we had to. One last thing. You know you're biased. I know you're biased. You're still connected to the Oilers. You still love the team. But but how do you feel about their chances tomorrow? You know, I'm really bullish. Um, and I have been all series. Uh, prior to the series, I thought the Oilers were the better team. And um, even when they got down 3 0, uh, I really I thought that, you know, Florida's a good team and they played well in some of those games. But most of the, the offense they produced was a result of the Oilers' mistakes. And, and that's what you've seen in the last three games. The Oilers have made much fewer mistakes. The Oilers have much more offense. They're, they're, they're not anything like our team in 2006 when we lost to Carolina. They can score goals. And if they can just eliminate the mistakes, there's no question they're going to win a cup. Kevin Lowe, really nice talking to you. Thanks very much. My pleasure, Ian. So for these players, high stakes, high pressure, but also lots of help when it comes to dealing with the stress. And here's somebody who knows a lot about that. Matt Demoisak is a sports psychologist. You've worked with some high-end athletes. Yeah, I have the pleasure of working with elite athletes, uh, top performers, whether it's rodeo, hockey, business owners and leaders, and some amateurs who want to work their way there. So I get a really nice, interesting diversity of people that I get to work with. And the Oilers are working with a guy named George Mumford, yes. who you know his work, and mm -hmm. you're really impressed by him. 100%. My favorite sports psych book is actually his first book, The Mindful Athlete. I think that he does a really good job of being really personable and down to earth, but sharing like really relevant and important like science and research to help performance be at their best, be present no matter the stake, no matter how big the moment is. I think they couldn't have hired a better person to kind of be with this team building this culture. The proof, of course, is in how the Oilers are doing, mm -hmm. coming back from three games to none. But, but the evidence is sort of in the way they speak. So I want to play some clips from today. Okay. And let's start with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Well, you got to prepare just like uh, you always do. You know, obviously it's not your ordinary game. Everybody understands that. But you got to make it as ordinary um, as possible in your, in your head. Um, you know, I think part of that is just sticking to your routine, you know. Um, our room has done a great job of, um, you know, being uh, at our best in these big moments and um, I would expect no different tomorrow. We're all human and we're aware of the situation and what we've accomplished so far. So what do you hear in those clips? I think collectively hearing the responses from Jai Settle and McDavid, I hear this sentiment of just keeping it the same, keeping it ordinary. I like that McDavid used that word because the thing about being in the zone or being in flow state, it's a thing that all sports psychologists are obsessed about, is that it's a state where everything is either known or you're okay with not knowing. So when you approach a game seven kind of situation and you start thinking about how it's different or it's bigger or there's more pressure, all of a sudden it makes it more difficult to be in a flow state because your brain's looking for new information. It's trying to figure, oh, do we have to do something differently? Do I have to prepare differently? But clearly with the coaching staff and with Mumford and just everything this team has learned throughout the course of the season, they understand that just by preparing the same way they have every single game, they increase the chance of them being at their best. Okay, the guy with the toughest job, I would say, well, both goaltenders, but uh, Stuart Skinner for Edmonton. Let's uh, listen to him. I'm definitely feeling good. I've, I've felt good uh, many times in the season. I've also felt um, terrible in uh, lots of spots. Um, I, I remember uh, Fleury said this once. He said sometimes when he has the worst practices and the worst warm-ups, he ends up playing the best games. So um, at this point, it doesn't really matter. It's just about, you know, 
coming in and being ready and preparing my absolute best that I can be for tomorrow. And what about Stuart Skinner? Yeah, I love that Skinner quoted Flurry uh, about even if you feel bad when you wake up and your warm-up's bad, you can still play amazing. One of my favorite little bits of psychoeducation is teaching people that you are not your thoughts or your feelings. We always have an opportunity to respond differently than what that original state is because brains be doing brain things, right? We can't exactly control what that first feeling is going to be. So Skinner understands that even if the nerves are a bit higher or even if he feels a little bit shaky after that first shot, it doesn't matter because he always has an opportunity to rebound and refocus on how he got himself there and how he is so confident in his ability and in what the team is doing in front of him. And he's so honest. He's willing to say that he had good days and he had bad days. I find that remarkable. I think that kind of genuineness, it makes it easier for him to kind of be in the spotlight. He has no secrets. He's not pretending that he's a gladiator, that he makes no mistakes, that he's perfect. By showing the human side of himself, he's comfortable handling the ups and downs in a game, which is just exactly what hockey is about, is the ups and the downs and the mistakes that you can't control. And I have full confidence that he'll be able to be exactly who we need him to be tomorrow. All right, Matt, thank you very much. You bet. Coming up, the toddler who's so excited for the Oilers, he's singing himself to sleep. Plus, it's been kept going by hard work and the support of the community, the hospital that's led the way in Indigenous health care. After decades of struggle to stay afloat, the only First Nation-run hospital in Quebec marks a century of healing. And 40 years after a hard-fought agreement to construct a new facility, with this piece by piece. Kateri Memorial Hospital in Ganawage remains a leader in Indigenous health care under Indigenous direction. That principle of uh, community control was paramount. For people there, the hospital is more than just a health care centre. As Gunna Co Deer shows us, it's a symbol of what can be accomplished when community members put each other first. That was the old baby clinic too, we were, I worked in. See, I remember working in this big ward in the back. How old were you in that photo? Mm, probably in my 20s, 1974, so 21. Retired nurse Wendy Skye Delarone spent the majority of her career working at the Cattery Memorial Hospital Centre. And still sometimes I look at it on there. Ooh, we really have one, you know, like, you know, to, I could go, I just have a sudden, sorry. But to think of all the work that people put in, the former directors, the people in the community giving money for the bingo and all these things so that our patients wouldn't go like to a nursing home somewhere, uh, you know, how many miles away and you can't get there every day, it would be very sad for them, you know. Having access to a hospital with a long-term care facility nearby is rare in many First Nations, but this hospital has been a leader when it comes to First Nations healthcare. It was founded by Jesuit missionaries over a hundred years ago, but in 1955, tired of financial woes and a building in need of repairs, the order of nursing nuns who were running the place packed up everything and left. Newspaper articles covered how bingos were keeping the place afloat. Community volunteers had taken over running the hospital, handling everything from administration to nursing. You'd hear the stories about how people used to do their jobs and then go to the hospital to volunteer to make sure it kept, kept running, to make sure it was moving forward. That's the old hospital. In this position now, you know, looking back at all the resilience that our community had to keep the hospital going. We have our new physio here, and this is our well baby clinic. So this was all brand new renovated to with renovation and expansion. So this is when I think it first opened, yeah. The big complaint is the age of the building. It's not laid out as a hospital, and the nursing stations are right next to the patient's beds. We were worried about fire all the time. We hung tin cans on the ceiling so the rain wouldn't come on our patients. What do you think of like when you see this? Oh my god. I think like how fortunate we are that these individuals advocated for us to get a new hospital. At the time, it was the only First Nations run health center in Canada, but it was still falling apart. The community spent decades advocating for a new building. And in 1984, they were finally given a promise. 
The Quebec government would fund the construction and Gunawage would keep its independence. We'd like to present you with this peace pipe. Today is an important step in that joint approach. The federal government always said that we are not uh, responsible for building, capital funding. And the province, of course, said, uh, well, we don't have the, the, the money. And also, uh, this is a, a building that would have to be put on reserve. So it was a constant uh, ping pong battle between back and forth. And it was very, very frustrating. Donald Horn helped negotiate that promise. It took years, but in the end, control over the hospital stayed where it needed to, and the new building finally opened in 1986. But I think we deserve it because of the fact that we, we worked so hard with what we were doing and we, and we made it. That principle of uh, community control was paramount. So I'm very thankful for the 1984 agreement. It's been 40 years since that agreement was signed. Gunawage is celebrated in April. Three of my grandparents scored here in the long-term care. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, we, we take for granted that we have something like this in our, in our backyards. And this hospital is a perfect example of cultural safety. People, they can come here. Most of the people here, they can speak their language, they understand the culture. The hospital also marked the completion of another round of renovations and an expansion to meet the needs of a growing community. The significance of the hospital is to be able to get your care within your community and for our community members to be taken care of by community members as much as we can possibly do that. For Sky Delaronde, the hospital's history needs to be remembered. The younger people have to understand that this does not fall from the sky, all this stuff. you got to work for it. It's better that we're, we're running it, you know. You feel more confident. This is ours. Like, nobody's going to take it away. It's ours, you know. And you can decide what's best for your own people. This hospital is a place of many firsts, and people here are really proud of. The care that they receive from people they know in their own community is a shining example of what First Nations healthcare can be. And throughout June, CBC has marked National Indigenous History Month with a project called FIRST, celebrating the First Nation, Inuit, and Métis trailblazers. Coming up, cheering on the Oilers, even in your sleep. <laughs> this little fan's hockey lullaby caught on tape in our moment. This is Theo and his little brother Archie, and if you couldn't tell from their attire, they are Oiler fans. They're also from High Level, Alberta. Theo's such a big fan that he was caught singing himself to sleep with the Oilers chant. His dad uh, caught the hockey lullaby on camera, and tonight it makes our moment. I had a baby monitor and I could kind of hear it and I'm like, what is he saying? So, of course, like, I grabbed it, turned it up as, as loud as I could and then I heard him, like, do the chant and, you know, the Let's Go Oilers. And then, like, finished it with the Calgary Sucks and I was just like, oh my goodness, this is hilarious. We were watching Game 4 on the Saturday night. He was able to watch it with us. He could hear the crowd on the TV, right? He could hear the Let's Go Oilers in the crowd. So, I started saying it and then he started saying it. And then the next day was when he was going down for his nap and that's what he sang himself to sleep with. He probably sang it for probably, for, I would say, 10 minutes. <laughs> and then he went right out. He's two and a half. He's always, uh, he's a little copycat. He tries to, he says everything we do, which, you know, we have to be very careful what we say. But for this one, I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> so Calgary, of course, is not in the finals. They weren't in the playoffs. So if you're a Calgary fan, you're probably wondering, like, why that gratuitous little end to that lullaby? Although if you're a parent of little kids or been the parent of little kids, you know, sometimes they can embarrassingly just echo what they hear from their parents at home. So I think that's where that's coming from. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanna-Mansing and I'll be back tomorrow night again for a special edition of The National from here in Edmonton as the Oilers look to bring the Stanley Cup back to Canada. Good night.